Hello and welcome to Future Squared. Stephen Hawking once said that intelligence is the ability to adapt to change, so let's adapt. My name is Steve Glaveski, and each week I'll bring you conversations with preeminent thought leaders from a variety of fields to help you think in a multidisciplinary way, kick goals in your professional and personal life, and better navigate what is fast becoming a brave new world. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation accelerator that works with organizations to unlock their people's latent potential to create more impact for humanity and lead more fulfilling lives. If you need help driving your organization's innovation strategy, visit collectivecampus.io. And without further ado, come with me if you want to live. The biggest analogy in the 20th century was somebody as a leader in chaos, who actually was a terrible leader in peacetime, was Winston Churchill. You know, Churchill was kind of relegated to the sidelines in the 1920s and and 30s after he screwed up Gallipagate. But he was exactly the right person to operate when the odds were all against Britain and the United Kingdom and turned out to be probably the best choice ever for a wartime CEO. Welcome back to Future Squared for episode number 378 with Steve Blank. Steve Blank is considered by many to be the father of modern entrepreneurship. And he returns to Future Squared to talk COVID-19 startup survival strategies. Steve is credited with spearheading the customer development movement, which was popularized by his former pupil, Eric Ries, in his book, The Lean Startup. We discussed the specific steps that startup CEOs and to an extent, leaders at large organizations too, should be taking in order to not just survive COVID-19, but with some luck, come out the other side stronger. Specifically, we talked startup runway and why it's no time to move slowly if yours is short, whether COVID-19 is a three month, one year or three year problem, whether you need a new business model and operating plan, new opportunities presented by COVID-19, how to manage board and investor expectations, and whether the funding well has run dry, compassionate leadership, and a hell of a lot more. So with that, it is with much pleasure that I welcome back to the show, the one and only Steve Blank. Welcome to the show, Steve. Thanks for having me. No, it's an absolute pleasure to have you back on. I don't even know if you remember, but I had you on the show over four years ago. I think it was episode seven, and you were one of the first uh, big names, shall I say, to join the show. And that just opened the floodgates. And since then, it's been, you know, Adam Grant and Tim O'Reilly and um, Kevin Kelly and you name it. So I guess I owe you a debt of gratitude for uh, being the first, the first mover, shall I say, who just opened the floodgates to uh, get everyone else on board. I think it's just the quality of the podcast. Oh, well, there you go. Very, very well said. <laughs> um, so I know you're joining me all the way from uh, Pescadero in California. Um, how are you uh, going with all of the social distancing? Uh, we're doing a lot of hiking. That's all I could say. Is uh, We're lucky that uh, we don't get to see anybody outside, but uh, hopefully this will be over and uh, everybody will be uh, stay healthy and safe uh, when it's done. Yeah, well, that's that is that is the great hope, and um, that is something we'll be talking about today. Um, obviously, the world looks very different today than, say, just thirty days ago. Uh, the stock markets have plunged, schools have closed down, shopping malls have shut down, the NBA season has been suspended, the Olympics have been moved to next year. Like this is like nothing else we've seen. And I know, Steve, that you lived through uh, the. GFC, you lived through the dot-com bubble bursting at the turn of the millennium. You, you lived through 1987. How does this compare? Well, you know, all those uh, were kind of economic crises mm. caused by, you know, fundamentals of tulip bubbles, bursting, like the housing market was a just an artificial bubble and collapsed, which took banks with it. The dot-com bubble, you know, when it collapsed, it took telecom, but it was also a IPO bubble and, and uh, cratered uh, public markets. Um, but this is something that's never happened before. This is kind of a, a man-made on purpose economic crisis to save the lives of potentially hundreds of thousands or maybe even more. We don't know, uh, but we're doing it to ourselves 
for uh, all the right reasons. Um, so it's unlike anything we've seen. But the consequences for companies, whether they're startups in your basement or you know the largest corporations, are profound. We're changing the economies of of every country in the world, um, and that <clears throat> just perfect intersection of a food fight between Saudi Arabia and Russia with oil prices uh, created even more chaos um, mm. at the same time. Yeah, and um, I mean, when this thing first uh, kicked off, numerous economic analysts were saying, well, look, it's just an external event. It's not pointing to some internal structural issues with our capital markets, but this external event is now leading to people losing their jobs. We're looking at maybe 20% uh, unemployment in the United States, and that's obviously going to have all sorts of ripple effects on supply and demand. Right. So, you know, there are whole set of companies that are being affected in different ways. Um, you know, once uh, areas go into shelter in place, uh, there are companies that uh, ha have no control of their fate at all. If you're a restaurant, you're basically closed. Mm. Um, if you're an airline, you're also almost basically closed. I mean, Qantas just parked uh, most of its fleet and laying off tens of thousands of workers and, and uh um, or if you're in hospitality and hotels, uh, you, you, these are completely out of your control, mm. regardless of what you do. Um, but there are other classes of, uh, uh, of companies or there are early stage companies that are not cash flow positive that are now scrambling for what to do. There are later stage companies, still um, startups, but have cash and have customers, but also wondering if those customers are still there. There are larger companies who have cash, but, you know, worrying about how long this is going to go. And then there's a category of companies, uh, actually two types of categories. One is large companies um, whose business is booming now. If you're Amazon or Zoom or any type of uh, telemedicine or, or health or remote anything, this is your time. You've been waiting this for, for, for years, if not decades. And then finally, there's a category of companies that, you know, it's not obvious uh, that they should succeed, but if they pivot um, and take stock of uh, what the new normal might be, they potentially could come out of this with a very different but successful business model. Mm. So so you have to kind of sort out what's going to happen. you got to kind of first say what's going to happen to who and, and, and what state of the company's in, and then put together a, a playbook for each one of them. And... Uh, and, and there's kind of steps to do that. There you, it, and, and I'm happy to share kind of how to think of it, at least how I think about this um, and how I'm coaching my companies. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, definitely want to unpack uh, what startup CEOs or company CEOs in general should be doing, depending on what stage of the uh, company life cycle they're at, I suppose. But um, I mean, going back to those previous crashes, I mean, what were some of the common mistakes you saw leaders or CEOs make, uh, say, in 2008 or in 2000? Um, you know, there's kind of a category and they, they go on the spectrum of like, you know, panic on, on one side and just, you know, wild layoffs without thinking or just bad moves mm -hmm. versus complacency and um and not taking it seriously and building in burn rate that you should have gotten rid of way earlier. Yeah. And then the other failure mode was not recognizing the opportunity to pivot or to change as well. I have this plan. We're going to execute the plan. This is what the company is about without realizing that, well, the world really doesn't care what your business plan says. Mm. You know, the world has kind of changed. So, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll put them in, in three categories. Um, you know, panic moves, complacency moves, um, lack of vision of uh, of opportunities for or, or requirements for new business model, and then maybe fourth is um, um, not realizing that there will be a morning after, uh, and, and that uh, there will be a recovery. And what would you wish you would have kept in some form of mm -hmm. either people or resources, at least at a small state? So when you do come out of this, you will have either growth or a competitive advantage for people who, who tossed out everything. Yeah. Um, so, and we could talk about, about those in some detail, but, um, um, to be honest, the, the, the one that got me most of the time was, uh, complacency and not, it wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't that I didn't understand it was important. 
it was death by a thousand slices as well. Mm-hmm. We'll lay off 10 people and then another 10 people, then another 10 people without understanding that, that, um, that continual process demoralizes and paralyzes your entire company during that entire process. People don't feel safe and secure is that if you actually lay off everybody or as most as you need to pull down your cash flow, you do it once. And while people are in shock for a couple of weeks, they realize it's over, meaning the, the layoffs are over and the remain the survivors can get back to work. And probably maybe the last piece of what people, um, didn't do well then is uh, compassion uh, mm-hmm. for, I mean, companies will probably have to make and are making some pretty severe cuts um, and, and personnel costs are usually one of them. And those involves layoffs. But if you just do that as a heartless, you know, like, you know, yes, these are the numbers. Um, that's just not right for people or society or whatever. You know, what's the maximum amount of compensation? Do these people get first dibs on jobs coming back? You know, do you try to find them alternate places that are hiring? Because as I said, remember, this is not a um, overall crater for every component of the economy. There are, you know, in the United States, Amazon's trying to hire as many people as they can. Our retail stores are trying to staff up for hundreds of thousands of new jobs, mm-hmm. not the same jobs that people had in the last time, but it's not like there are now no, no new jobs. Uh, so if you're in a company, how can you find uh, and help the people you are going to lay off? If, if you're laying off engineers, there are startups in telemedicine or, or social media or whatever, um, uh, remote distance learning who, who would love to be hiring uh, uh, great people, help them find jobs. Um, uh, but you need to worry about the survival of your company as well. Yeah, and I think uh, executing with a healthy, healthy dose of compassion uh, is essential in these times. Even even with not only your own employees, but working with your clients or partners or suppliers and asking for say discounts to bring down that burn rate somewhat. Um, obviously, your clients are living in the same world and they're struggling too, but. Uh, you know, we've taken that approach with our business and reached out to numerous, say, SaaS platforms and said, Hey guys, everybody's doing it tough at the moment. Are you guys offering anything? And they would come back and say, Hey, next three months are on us. We appreciate this is a tough time and you shouldn't have to be worrying about paying a hundred dollars us or whatever the case was for our platform. Um, so I think it's been encouraging to see that not just from leaders, but from organizations as well across the, um, the value network, just supporting each other in this, in this tough time. But, um, we can talk a little bit more about leadership later, but first I think when we're delineating between different types of companies and how they should respond, I guess the first big thing leaders should be looking at is their, their, their runway. Because if this is, say, as you put it, a one-year problem, but we only have six months runway, then we've got a a big problem to solve. Right. And so let me put runway and burn rate in context. Actually, the first thing leadership needs to do, whether it's a startup or a large existing company, is kind of an internal and external assessment. And, And what I mean by that is look outside, you know, is this a nuclear winter that's going to damage your business for the next three years, next one year, or for the next three months? Mm-hmm. And, and as I said earlier, some businesses might actually say, and, and they're small, but, but in important segments that, no, this is a real opportunity for us. Others uh, are, are just being shut down by, by circumstances. So one is you need to do an external assessment and, and uh, figure out how long do you think this is going to last quarter by quarter? Just or what's the unemployment rate? What's the state of my customers? What's what's going on outside? And then you do need to do an internal assessment. An internal assessment is what's the state of my business, right? The external assessment, external assessment was the state of the economy and the state of the shutdown. Mm-hmm. Internal is, and now we'll get back to your point. What's my burn rate? How much cash am I burning each month? And that's gross burn rate. And if I'm a startup. Um, I have no revenue, so that's also equal to my net burn rate. <laughs> if if I'm a startup with some sales, okay, well, I you know you you do burn rate, you know, plus the positive cash you have coming in, and you still have a net burn rate. Now, what's that? And then you calculate how many months of survival you have at the current state. But here's the important part of this assessment: 
then you need to go and if you have existing customers, uh, get an estimate from your VP of sales and then don't believe it. <laughs> um, you need to get on the phone with your top either customers or prospects and ask them when they're putting orders in this month or if there's anything that can induce them, large discounts, anything, to put cash in your bank. Because your VP of sales, if they're like most VPs of sales, are still going to be optimistic because that's the nature of world-class VPs of sales. As a CEO, you that's the number one thing you need to validate is whether those orders are still there by still there is when will the check hit your bank or you're out of business yeah. and so this internal assessment uh, internal assessment needs to do, be done by the c level staff not not being outsourced to some you know second level managers the c level execs need to get in a war room for a day and put together a serious internal assessment of you know what are our fixed costs rent you know servers whatever it is what are our variable costs, commissions, uh, salaries, et cetera, and, and get a great handle on the five or 10 numbers that are important for survival. Um, and then realize that e even fixed cost, as you mentioned, rent, you know, might life be now all of a sudden a variable cost. And your CFO needs to get on the phone as part of this conversation. While you're getting on the phone with your VP of sales, um, your CFO needs to get on, a, uh, on the phone with all the people with fixed expenses and start asking uh, whether you could defer some of those. Um, and by the, this should be a one day exercise. And by the time you're done, uh, you need to get on the phone with your investors. If you're a private company, you need to get on the phone with your, you know, uh, venture capitalists or angel investors and say, here's our assessment of what it looks like outside. Here's our assessment of, you know, burn rate, runway, cash flow, you know, customers, et cetera. And see if they agree, mm. because the good news is invest investors are uh, looking at multiple companies while you're just looking at yours. And the odds are they probably know one or two things you've missed calculating or haven't looked at or or maybe have too rosy assumption or have uh, too pessimistic assumption. And they will kind of give you some insight. But but number one, you need to agree with your investors after. And this is this can't take days or weeks. This is like a one day or maybe two day all hands on sea level to kind of get a handle of where are we mm -hmm. uh, and share it with your investors. Because the next thing you're going to do is figure out, OK, what's the plan? And and the plan on, you know, April 1st can't look like the plan on March 1st because let's agree the entire world has changed. So what are you going to do? Mm. So so let me before I go go to step two, does that make sense about the assessment? Step no, one is assess. Th that makes perfect sense. I think just before we, we move on, it's probably worth just emphasizing what you mentioned around the uh, your head of sales because their view of the world is going to be based more likely than not on the past and on the prospects they had and how warm those prospects were maybe 30 days ago. But something you've um, spoken about and written about recently is the fact that your assumptions about uh, your business model may have been true 30 days ago, 60 days ago, but perhaps they're completely false now because the world looks very different. So don't assume or don't operate um under the supposition that those assumptions are still true and you have to go out and test that. You need to have those conversations with your clients. You need to speak to your investors if you have investors because they're going to have a better, uh, more refined view of the world based on the fact that they're dealing with so many other companies. So I think it was just worth uh, double clicking on that. Yeah, so let's triple click, click on that. I mean, that's why I mean the CEO needs to get on the phone with the VP of sales to your top customers. And you need to get their state of their health. Mm -hmm. How are their customers doing? You know, and where is this order? Um, and, and is there anything if something was, you know, in the later stages of a pipeline, what kind of discount would motivate them to write a check this week? Mm -hmm. Beca because, again, if you're teetering on cash flow negative, you know, the, the biggest thing for your survival is how many weeks, months, you know, or if you're lucky, years of cash do we have in the bank? Um uh, because uh, unless you're in one of the segments right now that are actually going to be booming, that is uh, uh, exploding in growth, um, your customers are not going to be doing well. Yeah.
Yeah, makes perfect sense. And, and I think that also um, builds upon, uh, you know, what you're essentially famous for, among other things, which is the customer development methodology, which evolved into the Lean Startup, which is test those assumptions and test them quickly, because otherwise you're operating on a false view of the world. And when you operate with bad information, you make bad decisions. Right. Or in this case, if you operate on no data, you'll just kind of, kind of come up with noise. Yeah. Um, by the way, the other piece of this is if you're a private company, uh, w- one of the key things that your CFO, your CFO is now going to be responsible for is cash management. And, and that includes, you know, assessing where is the state of your venture capitalist? Mm. You know, if you were assuming that there was going to be another round, this is a big idea for startup CEOs. You should understand that your investors are now also playing lifeboat. That is, lifeboat means they're deciding what the ship is sinking. What do they put in their lifeboat and what do they let go down with the ship? And and it's kind of hard to imagine. But for most VCs, their most valuable assets are their later stage deals. Though nowadays, later stage deals are not necessarily ones that are generating huge profits. They might be generating lots of revenue, but they've been operating at losses. Yeah. So VCs now need to figure out, I'll use an example of a public company, you know, Uber, Mm -hmm. you know, incredibly valuable. Their revenue was probably dropped 90% or Airbnb, you know, how do you stop those losses if you're a venture capitalist? Well, you need to pile cash in there that you no longer have for your early stage deals. That's the key point. Mm. Oops. And so if they're playing, (coughs) dad, I'm sorry. So if they're playing lifeboat, you ought to understand the commitment the commitment you had for your from your VCs who said we're right behind you. Uh, you might want to turn around again because they might not be. <laughs> and it's not out of malice, and it's not out of you know evil intent, or you know, or they're not lying through their teeth. I hope it's just that most of them haven't lived through you know this either. You know, if if they weren't around for the crash of two thousand, they don't know what it's like to you know, find all their money has, has disappeared. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I guess if you are an earlier stage startup uh, who was on the fundraising trail prior to this all happening, perhaps, I mean, should you be looking at things like offering lower valuations or perhaps better terms in, say, convertible notes where you give investors a, a larger discount? I mean, should we be looking at that already? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm laughing because you're not going to be offering anything. I mean, <laughs> this is it's it's this time um, that venture capitalists uh, earn the 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 phrase vulture vulture capitalists. capitalists yes, <laughs> um, and, and and again, it's um, in, in segments that are not necessary for you know people to survive today. You know, grocery on demand delivery and remote learning and you know social connectivity and telemedicine, et cetera, and anything else, you know, you're now a, a seller rather than, you know, it, it it's used a to be, you would stand right? around. Yeah. People would throw money at your feet. Those days are over, at least for the short term. Mm-hmm. So, you know, what, what you're going to negotiate is, is like the second order effect. You need to figure out if anybody is investing at all in the space you're in right now. It's mm-hmm. a big question. It's a huge question. Um, and, and as I said, I think VCs are scrambling this week and this by the end of this month to figure out what their strategies are for capital preservation. As I said, are they going to pour all their money into keeping their later stage deals afloat and have zero? For, for And so you need to ask, are you guys investing at all in early stage deals this month? And the answer for, I bet you about half of them will be no, you know, um, we're just trying to figure out, uh, you know, what we're going to do. Well, that that's new news. Or, you know, yeah, but, you know, we're only looking at deals that, like, we think will be big at the end of this thing. Mm. Because there will be some deals as smart VCs who won't just pick over the carcasses, but will figure out, is society or, or the world going to change after this? And new things going to be available or possible that just weren't before? So, for example, and I keep going back to telemedicine, but in the United States, um, the rules have changed probably forever on the ability of doctors to do diag- diagnoses across what we call state lines, um, across states slash provinces. Um, 
that used to be illegal. Now those laws have changed and will probably stay changed. You know, people have gotten used to home delivery in a way they've never been used to. Is that going to be permanent or not? That is, there's going to be a new class of startups that smart VCs are going to be saying, this is the future that we're, we are willing to invest in. Um, it doesn't mean that every other deal is dead. It just means it's going to be, first of all, the number of VCs are going to be investing in early stage deals. I, I'm fairly confident they're going to drop dramatic, dramatically for the next month or two. And that, too, is that they're going to be looking for startups that um, actually are looking to the what the new world looks like, not what the old world looks like. Yeah, and I think that's a great point. And um, actually conducted a, a bit of a thought experiment last night where I just drew two columns down on a page and took stock of who are some of the short-term winners and losers in this thing. And obvious ones in the winners column are things like your food delivery, um, supplement manufacturers, e-learning, video conferencing. And then in losers, you have things like tourism, restaurants, uh, conferences, sporting organizations, live music, all that sort of stuff. And I mean, in your uh, post on Startup Survival, you say that this could be a three-month problem, which is looking very, very remote at this stage. One-year problem or a three-year problem. And this is, if this is, a say, a three-year problem, well, then you might want to look at some of the uh, quote-unquote losers and say, how might we reinvent the business model for, say, concert uh, live concerts in a world where people are socially isolating. And that could be that you have concerts that are held in some sort of isolation bunker that's beamed out to, say, millions of people. And instead of paying $100 for a ticket, you pay five dollars for a ticket but then you get served up all sorts of uh offers to buy merchandise while you're watching that band play or maybe even branded face masks like who knows right i'm just riffing here and this is um just trying to make a point around it but there are potentially so many opportunities that this creates um particularly if this is as you say a three-year problem right and that brings us to if you remember i was talking about um the first step is assessing what's going on outside and inside and what you did just described is the second step. How do you plan and prepare for major changes? Mm -hmm. And so what, once you're agreed on what the world will look like, it's time to plan for your new company, even though you're in the middle of an existing one. And, and it, you really need to think about right now, everybody needs to think about three things. What pivots are necessary to your business model? What changes do you need to make to your operate, or operating plan? As I mentioned earlier, and what initiatives do you want to save for when the recovery does come? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so let's just start with the first part for pivots. You know, are, and you just went through some of the list. Are there new customers or new services or new channels to pursue? Are there parts of your business model that can now serve the new normal? Th that is, do you have great warehousing and supply chain that could be used for other purposes right now to deliver, uh, uh, you know, necessary essentials? Mm -hmm. Um you know, can you support remote work or social cohesion or, or, or home delivery, et cetera? You know, if you had brick and mortar locations, how, how much can you pivot to e-commerce uh, uh, so customers can uh, get goods without having to leave the home? Um, you know, online and virtual learning um, and while tourism and travel are dead. How about virtual travel? You know, mm -hmm. how can consumers get out? Um, how do you automate a remote workforce, not just one on one? But how do you do an entire remote company? There's a whole set of social cohesion stuff that just never, never was necessary before. That's really important. We talked about healthcare, but also entertainment. Now, you know, the, since movie theaters are, are closed and, and live theaters are closed, um, you know, Disney and others are now releasing movies, which is maybe never going to come back to to the theaters as a first run experience. Mm -hmm. It always used to be that uh, the theaters had a 90 day exclusive on first runs. Uh, that might change forever. So, so number one is what are the pivots to your business model? And I've, I've run into a couple of these, you know, um, I'll give you a good example of for your, and for your listeners to how to think about this. Um, I was working with one startup that had a great Slack add on for onboarding new employees. Well, obviously for most <laughs> businesses though some no but for for existing uh, businesses that are booming like uh, uh, you know warehousing and whatever they're still needed but for most of them that's no longer a feature but they also had a a, a way to kind of onboard and connect remote workers 
Well, all of a sudden, you know, I said, hey, guys, maybe you should triple down on your remote cohesion part. Mm. And of course, now they went from 10, 10 customers a week to 250 customers a week. Um, there was another uh, company that was doing um, a kind of an AI bot for clinicians, that is doctors and nurses in hospitals, to kind of just have dr- regular hospital drug uh, availability and, and diagnosis stuff. Well, it was pretty obvious their pivot was to have all the virus information uh, for their specific country and region uh, available like automatically and to, to track the, to match that to symptoms of patients. And again, they went from, you know, a 10 person startup in, in Singapore to something that's going to go international within the next month. These are pivots that are, are just take some um, take stepping back from your existing business model because i have to tell you even those ceos who i thought were world class those two i described had a hard time stepping back from oh here was my existing business on monday and and i i really can't why why should i do something new this is you know and, and it took some time a couple conversations for them to realize no this actually is a pivot that need, not only needs to be made but can make their business um, bigger and stronger and then the third piece of this, so number one was, uh, uh, excuse me, the second piece, number one was pivot to your business model. The second is uh, changes to your operating plan. And this is what cuts are you going to make to spending programs, marketing, service, manufacturing, R&D, what kind of lifeboat choices are you going to make, what layoffs to make, what payables get renegotiated, whether they're rents or leases, and what are the new roles for HR? Mm-hmm. HR, you know, used to be about job satisfaction. You know, you need to have a talk with your head of HR if you're big enough to have one, because their job now is managing layoffs, not job satisfaction. And, and there's a new corporate culture. Um, most startups operate on buy-in and consensus. Um, you know, that's kind of over in a crisis. Um, you'll be lucky if you survive with a benign, benign dictatorship. There's really not much time for a long term, you know, let's go study this problem. Um, you know, and, and what the startups need to do is spend two or three days figuring out what the new business model and operating plan is. Um, the, the first part, assessment, required just the C-level staff figuring this out. Um, but figuring out the new business model and operating plan, you can engage the entire company, the collective intelligence and wisdom of the company to kind of make suggestions of where should the company pivot? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some employees might likely have more ideas and see opportunities than you don't see if you're the CEO. And this also signals to them is that everyone is involved um, and you're going to be making decisions quickly to separate the crucial from the irrelevant. And in, in doing this, you need to communicate and communicate and communicate and communicate some more uh, about what's going on and uh, why you're asking for their ideas. And it's a perfect time to start a, a daily update from the C-level suite to let people know what you're learning and and when you begin begin implementing the changes, you tell them why. And as I said before, with the assessment, now with the new plan, you get back on the phone with your investors and say, last phone call was where we told you what the internal and external environment is. This phone call is about telling you what we're about to go do. Let us, and it's not what we're asking you to go do what we should do. We're telling you what we're going to go do. Mm. Tell us what we're missing, or we're going to go execute this. And then the, should I jump to the last part, the third part? Um, I guess just on, on that, I mean, telling your investors what you're going to yeah. do. I imagine there is an aspect, and maybe that's part three, the business model, where you actually define the assumptions that underpin all of that internal sort of pontification and then go out and test it before you commit, say, the next 24 months of the of your resources to it. Yeah, so, so that's where um, I, I would disagree. You, you don't really have time okay. uh, to run committee stuff here and, and let's run A-B test and whatever. You need to get on the phone to lots of people, but as this really is part of the third part, mm-hmm. which is you, you need to do stuff with speed and urgency. Um, you know, it's it's very funny. Is um, you know, people sometimes say there's you know there are peacetime CEOs and there are wartime CEOs. I don't know if you've ever heard that analogy. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, 
Um, uh, ben Horowitz of uh, Andreas and Horowitz venture capital firm likes to talk about that. I, I kind of think that misses the point. Uh, and it's typically, it's a phrase said by people who typically haven't been in war or haven't <laughs> served because it's a little glib. Um, you know, if you screw up in the, uh, if you screw up in a company, you know, you, you have layoffs and, and maybe you miss your bonus. If you screw up on the battlefield, you have KIAs killed mm-hmm. in action. And so, uh, you know, equivalencing them is a little glib and, and maybe a little, you know, more than that. But the part that people miss about um, leadership in wartime is that leaders who, who, who are in the tip of the spear, whether it's Army or Marines, they train for the fight. Mm -hmm. And they train and they train some more and they train for contingencies and they train all the time. And so when they're faced with something on the battlefield, you know, they understand that war is chaos and nothing goes per plan. But there are some some drilled in instincts about things you're supposed to do because you've trained for the fight. I want to compare and contrast that to CEOs of commercial companies. You're not trained for the fight. You know, for a startup, maybe you're trained for, if you're lucky, looking for product market fit. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a company that has repeatable and then you found product market fit, and now you're doing something repeatable and scalable, chaos is something you haven't trained for. And therefore, your reaction and your reaction time is way too slow. Uh, And if you stand around and wait for others or wait for enough data, you will be dead. And, and that is the analogy on the battlefield, other than the, the, war, the wartime leaders have been trained that you do not stand around and wait for some higher echelon to tell you what to do when you're in the middle of the fight. CEOs today, are, whether they volunteered or not, are in the middle of the fight, and mm-hmm. they need to make decisions rapidly. And speed and urgency, I believe, not panic, but speed and urgency is the most important attribute that a CEO can exercise right now. Um, it's not with no data. It's not with not without consulting your investors. If you remember, I said assess, plan, and now execute with speed, um, mm-hmm. implementing these changes. So this is just my reaction to now. Maybe we should go out and talk. Yes, you've got about twenty-four to seventy-two hours at most to go do that. Um, but it's not like let's spend the next month figuring out what to do or I, but this is just, you know, one man's opinion, but I think right now speed and urgency is, is paramount. Um, just, but there's a process to get there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can't, I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen, um, people just sit around and not being willing to make a decision. Um, and, and I just want to offer this to, uh, startups who aren't cash flow positive or, you know, depending on their investors to, to give them a next round. You know, if investors tell you it, when you have one of these board calls, oh, don't worry, things will blow over, we'll be right behind you. Uh, you know, I'd be asking, what's their skin in the game? Mm. Meaning, are they going to put their check in escrow for you right now because you believe otherwise? Or or like, you know, if you go out of business or, or out of cash and they go, sorry, we're not doing any more fall-on rounds, you know, you just put your company on a business and and being able to say a year from now, well, my investors told me to do this is not the right answer. Uh, you're in charge and you need to assess the situation. You need to make some plans and you need to, you know, uh, uh, operate like it's urgent because it is. Yeah. Um, and I guess a lot of. Be lucky, sorry, sorry to jump sorry, in, Steve. Just, no, go for it. Go for it. If you're happy to be, be lucky enough to have a year or two of cash in the bank, then then you have some time to plan and, and to, uh, to take some more time. But if you're cash flow negative, this is, uh, this is not the time to kind of sit around and, and think about, uh, um, uh, you know, think about what, it, what could be the right thing to do. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I guess uh, with a lot of CEOs who are, say, uh, pontificating a bit too much, not wanting to make any quick decisions, I guess they're fighting some of those evolutionary biases because deep down they realize that if everything has changed, well, then our entire business model needs to change, and that's going to create a hell of a lot of work. And uh, evolutionarily, uh, well, from an evolutionary perspective, we don't want to do that because we're wired to want to conserve energy. But the reality is that perhaps it is time to give into those fight or flight instincts and make a decision quickly and just are on the side of conviction rather than consensus, which is usually what characterizes a lot of companies. Yeah, and, and this will be Darwinian. Um, there will be CEOs who can't decide or decide not to decide or decide to kind of do half measures. And and if this uh, you know crisis continues for three months or more, then the, they will be the CEOs who ran their companies into the ground. Mm. Um, or they might be lucky and everybody gets go, gets to go back to work in 60 days and this kind of blows over and yeah. they were right. Yeah. That's when I, no, no, that's what, when I really said, you need to start with an assessment. You can't just say, let's go do X. That's mm -hmm. not what I'm advocating. Yep. You need to assess, you need to plan, and then you need to execute. And so if, if you're saying it's going to blow over in 60 days, Make sure you and your board like believe that because that's what you just bet your company at. Um, and 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 I I, I just want to emphasize there are different rules for companies in different states. Right mm -hmm. now, I've been talking about companies that are that are cash flow negative or will go cash flow negative. You need to uh, operate quickly. Uh, there are other companies, as I said, the opportunity is uh, is wow, we can now hire or pivot into something that create, can create a huge opportunity, but you still need to operate um, quickly. Um, other people are now figuring out the same thing. Uh, other people are going to be pivoting and taking advantage of this uh, opportunity, unfortunately, about how to retool their business. Um, you want to be there first. Uh, you want to be Zoom, not Skype. Excellent. So, I mean, the, the late Clayton Christensen, um, you know, his whole theory on disruption was that, uh, either you create a new market or you're a low end disruptor who, you know, like a discount retailer, eventually you start. You, you mean you start at the bottom of the market and eventually you take hold there and make your way up. Now, it seems to me that in the current sort of crisis, uh, you know, you've mentioned Zoom a, a few times, there's a whole numerous new markets being developed. Like if I think about Zoom, it seems like the corporate world has suddenly woken up overnight. Gen Xers and everyone older than them who are working for large banks and whatnot suddenly discovered Zoom and video conferencing and, and working from home. And that's created a whole new market. So, I mean, it's, it's easy for CEOs in the current environment to feel a lot of doom and gloom and like the walls are falling down um, around them or closing in on them. But if you look hard enough, if you uh, reflect on what assets you currently have, be they people, technology, whatever capital you have, have um, intellectual property and rejig that to uh, move towards some of these perhaps new markets. I mean, there, there are a hell of a lot of opportunities out there. And I mean, we've kind of alluded to some of them. You talked about the company with the Slack plugin who is pivoting towards um, uh, remote working. Uh, I, I guess it's just important to emphasize the fact that if you look for it, there are opportunities out there. Yes, and I want to double down on that. If you, which was your great statement, if you look for it, there are new opportunities out there. The problem is, is that there are some CEOs, and this is not a diss; it's just the nature of business, who are world class executors of process, procedure, growth through repeatable and scalable processes. Those are not people who are world class opportunists. That's mm -hmm. a very big difference. Um, you know, founders are world-class opportunists, but even them, it, it, as I've seen right now, it takes a smack in the head to get them off of their last opportunity <laughs> to recognize a new one. So disruption requires a kind of a different mindset. And this is where that wartime analogy actually, you know, if you're trained for it, then you are trained to recognize that chaos is the normal kind of condition. If you're trained for execution, that is, you've gotten your MBA and everything was a case study and everything worked by spreadsheet and you were great at management and, and management processes, that's not the world you're living in as of like a week ago. 
So it's kind of a different mindset is required. Um, it's ironic that uh, the best people at this are turnaround CEOs who come into companies, assess quickly what needs to be done, come up with a new business model and execute ruthlessly. Think about those people. That's exactly what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, or at least the ones who are doing it well. It. Yeah. Or, or think about CEOs who come from dysfunctional families where nothing was the same every day and they operated in chaos and they learned to shut out anything that wasn't relevant to their survival. Mm. That's exactly the, the personality type you need right now. And if it's if not who you are, it's that's okay. That's not who you are. But you need to understand the difference of who you are on the 1st of March and who you need to be on the 1st of April if you still want a company. Yeah. Um, does that make sense? No, that makes perfect sense. And I think uh, uh, what you're – what you've talked through there kind of echoes uh, a report from the University of Sydney on red brain and blue brain thinkers, uh, which essentially found that certain people, um, when they're assessing risk, their amygdala lights up like a Christmas tree, um, and therefore they tend to make better managers of existing organizations, better executors of process. Um, and then on the other side of that, you had blue brain thinkers who tend to be a lot more open to risk, and they tend to become, uh, I suppose, better uh, or more open to entrepreneurship, more open to adapting and and ducking and weaving with the punches. Um, And it's funny because with a lot of large organizations, uh, the people who rise to the ranks uh, tend to be people in the, in the former camp. And now in the current environment, you know, you mentioned Qantas, but you know, obviously all the big banks, um, large telecommunications organizations, tend to be managed by people who do well with process, procedure, uh, consensus seeking, uh, lots of meetings. Um, but in this environment, they might find that people who uh, lead them to, say, uh, record share prices under times of uh, normal, shall we say, quote unquote, conditions may not be the right people for the job to kind of steer them out of this. Yes, you're absolutely right. And, and in fact, the the biggest an- analogy in the 20th century was somebody uh, a- as a leader in-, in chaos who actually was a terrible leader in peacetime was Winston Churchill. Mm. Um, you know, uh, Churchill uh, was kind of relegated to the sidelines in the 1920s and, and 30s after he screwed up Gallipagate. Um, but he was exactly the right person to operate when the odds were all all against the Britain and the United Kingdom and turned out to be probably the best choice ever for a wartime CEO. And when peacetime was at, peacetime was at hand, the populace said, you know what, we just need somebody who, who could stably execute because we're exhausted and we won. Let's go back to execution. Um, um, but I think if you think about that type of personality, um, that's what you need in wartime and and at peacetime you do need the executors. And this is not a, again, a, a diss or, or no. a, you know, saying one is better or worse. It's just that the circumstances have now changed. And, and as I said, most CEOs who have been peacetime CEOs have not had the luxury of being trained on how to think like a wartime CEO. And and again, that, that, that training, it, it is possible to kind of develop that mindset. Um, and unfortunately, you're going to have to create that mindset very rapidly. And that's why I went through even for execution CEOs, here's a process. So I've given you a process Mm -hmm. to kind of manage and think about a chaotic situation, you know, step by step, assess, plan and execute, but do it rapidly. And that's the hardest part for for people who are, who are not, not comfortable in making decisions. And, and, you know, in a large company, when, um, in the largest companies, when you're about to make a, 10 or a hundred million dollar bet or even bigger, you want a hundred percent of the data. I mean, you know, I'm about to kind of invest all of this money or stuff for people and resources. And so I want to make sure I have, you know, certainty. Well, the problem is, is that there isn't going to be certainty here and people who strive for certainty are going to just be operating way out of their comfort zone because first of all, an assessment, no one knows how long this is going to last. It could last three months. It could last three years. We don't know. So yeah. you're going to have to put a stake in the ground. How long do you think you, you this will go on that will affect your business? 
and your life and the health of your family and your your company and your community and your country. Mm-hmm. You know, step two is what's the plan for that? And and you don't have months to put together planning committees and run scenarios. You don't have that time. Time is not your friend here. Um, and that is an un- and then you need to make cuts that will last and you just need to make them once. Uh, the worst thing you could do to destroy a company is make them month by month. It's like slicing the salami off. It's just as terrible yeah. because everybody is looking over their shoulders and, and productivity drops almost to zero because people are just worried, am, am I next? Get it done with and just g- get on with surviving and then building a successful business. Yeah. And, yeah. and again, if you're one of those lucky companies um, that actually are in a space or can pivot to a space, then instead of cuts, there are going to be world-class people on the street. Figure out how to hire them or partner with companies who are laying off and, and that you know have great people and figure out how to hire them and bring them in ASAP um, because those people are never going to be available again. So if you happen to be in a space that's going to be growing or or, it, it, or you could pivot to that space, um, vacuum up all those people that were impossible to hire before. Um or vacuum up all those other resources, whether they're channel or physical goods or whatever, that just weren't available and are now going to be completely available. Yeah. Uh, so this this is a time for for opportunistic thinking for both survival and for growth. And and just remember um, that the world, you know, the sun will come up um, every morning, and eventually we will all go back to work, and hopefully. You know, most people will still be healthy and their families will, will still be healthy and, and commerce will resume, but it will resume in a different way. And so, you know, what kind of company are you going to look like yeah. um, when this is over? No, that makes sense. And you've touched on quite a few uh, very, very poignant points there, Steve. I think, I mean, it's impossible to have a perfect solution uh, to a to an ambiguous and rapidly evolving problem. Um, like you said, it's uncertain. So we can't have a perfect solution. We just need to back something, you know, obviously have our conversations with our clients, with our investors, with our, uh, with our team and just make a decision and stick to it. Um, but then also that it is a buyer's market. So, I mean, we've been talking a lot about organizations who perhaps, uh, are cash flow negative, don't have too much runway left, uh, what they should be doing. But if you have say 24 to 36 months run, way, if you're cash flow positive, um, it's a buyer's market. And not just when it comes to hiring, but when it comes to perhaps buying up um, competitors who perhaps aren't in the same position as you are and buying up their customers or or the traffic coming through to their websites um, or other complementary organizations. Like if you are on the other side of the spectrum and you do have uh, plenty of cash reserves, this is a, a great time for you. That's right. And, and I think, uh, and I think that's again, Part of step two is assessing your business model. And, and is it possible to do some of those things that were just not possible before? Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, it's, it's interesting because oftentimes when people go through something uh, devastating in their lives, be it, it could be a, a cancer scare, it could be a divorce. And, and when those people are actually poked and prodded as to, you know, how, how was that experience? And oftentimes what they say is, look, they wouldn't change it because it forced them to reflect on their lives. Uh, it forced them to make some massive changes uh, to how they show up every day. Uh, perhaps they were doing a job they hated and they quit that and now they're doing something they love. They're spending more time with their family and their friends. Sometimes it takes a devastating event to force us to reflect on how we're living our lives. And I guess the same applies now with a lot of um, companies companies and, and startups and CEOs. And I remember having a conversation with uh, Mark Randolph, uh, Netflix's co-founder, a few months ago. And he uh, told the story of uh, the early days when they essentially had to winnow down their staff because uh, this was post.com boom. The uh, you know, capital was drying up. They needed to get rid of a lot of what he said uh, were B players, which meant that they were left with nothing but A players. And this forced them to effectively perform at a much higher level thereafter. And then a couple of years after that event, they ended up IPOing. Now, of course, there's numerous reasons for that, but sometimes these events, can actually make you stronger, uh, providing uh, the execution uh, is there. That's right. And uh, I, I think disruption is always a, uh, um, an important change for people and careers and lifestyles. Um, 
in, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I think early on in human beings when we were all living on the savanna, you know, <laughs> with, with just st- sticks and spears, a couple of things happened. Is, um, y- you know, most of the time people were kind of scrambling for, you know, hunters and gatherers and tr- trying to hunt game. And it might have been a nice place in the savanna, but there was always some percentage, very small, but always some percentage of, of the tribe who would say, I wonder what's over the next hill. And mm. like people would go, Hey, wait a minute. It's great here. We finally got enough food for the, you know, for the first time. And someone would say, I wonder what's over the next hill. And most of the time the people, those small percentage of people like would never come back because they would get eaten or it was worse there. But every once in a while, someone would come back and go, there's a lot more food over here. And, and these, <clears throat> and these people were the outliers. Uh, you know, I happen to believe that there's a, kind of a recessive gene um, literally based on something like that that was built into the reason why we survived as a as a species was that um, there was always some crazy people who always wondered what was over the next hill. Um, and when things were fine, they were the outliers. Uh, but when a crisis happened, a lot more people started wondering, I wonder what's over the next hill or or even, well, it can't be worse than what's here. So when mm. the food supply dried up on that savanna, a lot of people went, yeah, let's go with other people because, like, we're starving to death over here. Um, so my point is, is, this is back to what you just said, is that normally it's the few crazies who start startups or quit good jobs. But in, a, in, a, in an environment that's been disrupted, more people actually think about, well, wait a minute. I'm working from home. I might as well try. I, they won't know if I'm working three jobs. I could try out something else. Or, gee, you know, what is my life about? And maybe I don't want to be making fart apps anymore. Maybe, <laughs> you know, or uh, maybe I ought to be giving back to my my community or my country or serve God or something else. Yeah. Um, maybe I want to. Maybe I want to make my life matter. These are usually wake up calls. Crisis usually does that to individuals and societies about thinking about you know we only have a short time here um, how do we want to live it and and how do we want to spend our lives um and at minimum how do we want to spend our careers uh, when you're in the middle of it you think it lasts forever but um you're only going to be around and productive for you know maybe 20 30 years um maybe 40 if you're lucky yeah. uh, what do you want to do with that time um and, and i think um, a lot of people will, will come out of this um uh, um, asking that question, and um, I, I think we'll see a lot of new things start um, out of the rubble of, of this crisis, uh, and a lot of them will be positive for um, you know community and country and and, uh, and the world. Yeah, and I, I think uh, when you don't have a plan B, you definitely go all in on plan A. So I think that's a wonderful place to uh, wrap this up, Steve. Um, thanks so much for, for taking the time to appear on Future Squared. Um, if people want to learn more, they can check out the survival uh the startup survival guide on your website uh, that's at steveblank.com you also published a blog post from uh, Jeff Epstein over at Bessemer Venture Partners uh, which just provided a list of what CFOs could be doing uh, to try and extend their runways as much as possible uh, to give them a little bit more breathing space in these difficult difficult times and people can find you on Twitter at SG Blank is there any anything else you'd like to share just before we, we close no just be brave uh, stay healthy stay safe and Think about what comes uh, comes after the recovery. Well, that's it. Thank you so much, Steve. Hope you stay safe. All right. You too. Take care. Hi, guys. Steve again. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to receive a weekly email from me, complete with reflections, books I've been reading, words of wisdom, and access to blogs, ebooks, and more that I'm publishing on a regular basis, just leave your details at futuresquared.xyz forward slash subscribe, and you'll receive the very next one. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, take a minute to like, share, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. It goes a long way to giving the podcast the exposure it needs so I can continue bringing you guests and conversations of the highest caliber. You can catch me on Twitter at Steve Gliveski and on Instagram at TheSteveGliveski. Until next time, hasta la vista, baby.